country philosophy is you know, kind of know what I call my way of thinking sometimes. Um, and today I'm going to talk about who it is that I associate with and what my standards are for associating with, with people. And I, I, I'm going to say right off the bat, it's different for different people. It's not a consistent standard across the board. So here's an example. When I want to think about the, the people who I want to associate with, who are, I'll call them thinkers. These are people who have intellectual honesty, above average IQ, uh, have done a bit of reading, uh, just have really taken an interest in social science or philosophy or history or uh, that kind of thing. And, and not just, you know, they watch CNN or Fox News in the background or intently and think, oh, well, it's just weird that all those talking heads happen to say the same things that I believe in day after day after month after year. Uh, not those folks, but people who really sit down and, and study and contemplate and listen to other people's ideas. Well, th those people, the, the thinkers, I have a very high standard for them. I have maybe half a dozen at most people in my life who are really, truly high-level thinkers. My standards for them are very strict. Not just anybody gets to be in, in that inner circle. And so I have very strict standards, as I said. But in other areas, my standards are not as strict. One of my friends, who is a, a thinker, in my top three thinkers on my list, he argues that it probably wouldn't make much sense for people to associate with people who don't live by the, the principles that, that you know a person thinks is most important. So if I think the non-aggression principle is important, then I probably ought not to associate with people who do not live by the non-aggression principle, etc. And I, I see that point, and I don't closely associate, perhaps, with those people, or I don't choose them as my thinking and my debate partners. Um, however, I do associate with them. The clerk at the local convenience store is not a thinker, but she's a really nice person, and we joke around, and I think I brighten her day each time I go in. And I'm going to continue doing that. And I don't think my friend is arguing that I, I shouldn't go out into the world because not everybody agrees. But, but I'm going to narrow this down some. Let's look at somebody who's a, I'll call him a neighbor, someone who lives somewhat close geographically to me. And they don't think about thinking. That's just not an area of interest. Uh, philosophy, morality, uh, politics, it's a kind of a, a unique little niche uh, thing to think about, especially the philosophy and the morality, uh, which is a part of philosophy, but th that part especially is a very niche thing. And I get that out of every hundred neighbors, probably at best one or two might have any interest in that. Uh, and then if I spread out my neighbor circle to be even larger, uh, out of a thousand nearest neighbors, maybe out of the five or 10 or 15 who are interested in philosophy, maybe one or two actually put effort into reading about it, uh, listening to lectures, podcasts, you know, whatever, uh, to, to really investigating it further and, and spend a measurable amount of each day contemplating it. So this is a very small group of people. And among those people, there are a lot of really good folks. A lot of good, in my situation, country folks. Country folk who will let you borrow their shovel or their lawnmower or will come over and help you put your roof up or just are friendly, good, helpful, uh, good, solid human beings. And, and one of these, uh, an example of one of these type of people would be Lavoy Finnegan. And I read his book, I think it's only through Blood and Suffering. A novel, but one of the few novels that I just absolutely love. 
uh, because there's a good bit of uh, philosophy uh, included in this novel, along with a, a James Wesley Rawls type prepper thing, along with a Louis L'Amour type Western thing. So you, you, I wouldn't think that that would be my kind of book, but I did really like it. And at the conclusion of that book, I said to myself, well, Lavoy is a, uh, a theist, and he's a very strong theist. Uh, his beliefs in that way are very strong. And he is a conservative uh, or a, a righty. Uh, and I don't know what the correct word for that is. All these generalizations are, are not accurate. But he, he thinks that, you know, you ought to spank your children and you ought to vote for the person who will be your master, and it's okay if there are taxes, they just need to be small, and very much pro-government kind of guy. But even though he wasn't philosophically pure, there were a lot of general life skills, characteristics about him that made me think at the end of the book, I would be proud to call him my neighbor. I, I, I think he would come over for barbecues. I'd go over to his place. We would help each other out with chores. We would be friends. Now, we wouldn't be able to discuss beyond a certain level uh, deep intellectual concepts because it's not his area of interest. Just as when he starts talking to me about, uh, you know, 80, 16 welding rods and how they're different than the, the 60, 70 ones, uh, I don't know what this stuff means. I'm, that he's into an area of specialty that I just I, I ignorant about. I don't know, uh, and maybe I'm interested in learning more about welding rods. But at the moment, I, I just don't know. And maybe he would be interested in philosophy beyond kind of reaching that point that that a lot of conservatives kind of get a little inkling that they might like liberty as well as um, rightism, and so they do a little bit of research into it, and, and up to a point, <clears throat> they, they believe in liberty, and then they just stop, and they're, they're, they can't bring their brain to step out of the box and go any further, and, and I believe that Lavoie fell into that, that category, but he could have been a great neighbor of mine, and we could have talked about general welding things, general philosophy things, but there would become a certain uh, place in the conversation that, that, that we couldn't go beyond in those topics and many others. And so my standards for a casual friend neighbor who will be there for me when I roll my car and it's stuck and I need him to bring his, his you know, backhoe over and tip it out of the ditch for me and, and give me a ride home in his jacket because I'm cold and shivering, uh, that is a good friend. I mean, not a philosophy friend, but he's a good friend. And I'd be proud to call Lavoy my friend, as I would many of my actual neighbors in the real world. So I am willing to associate with people who I bring value to, they bring value to me, uh, we enrich each other's lives, and they are imperfect, as am I. There are a lot of areas, even in you know, I think I'm come some kind of special lay philosopher here that I've got got philosophy, I've got a handle on it. Well, no, I, I have so much to learn. I just read Hume for the first time and was blown away. And I'm going to have to read uh, just that one little book. I'm going to have to read, and in my case, read it on Audible, listening to it, probably another two or three or four or five times until I, I grasp even a portion of it. So I, I, I'm not saying that I'm the, the smartest or the best philosopher out there. Uh, I've got lots of room to grow, and, and I recognize the same in my neighbors. We're all at different places in our journey, and uh, that's okay. And we can be friends, and we can be neighbors, and, and get along with each other. So those are some thoughts about uh, my standards for neighbors. Oh boy, we're going to talk about violence, threatening violence, if a neighbor is very obviously going in opposition of the non-aggression principle, is that an absolute uh, showstopper? All right, let's get into this next topic. I'm going to use an example that, uh, that hasn't really occurred in my life, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend that it has. And I live in the, the rural western U.S. cattle country, 
And so I'm going to give a good cattle country cowboy name to a, an imaginary neighbor. We're going to call him Slim. And we're going to make up a little bit about Slim and, and then talk about the philosophy behind it, my, my viewpoints, my perspectives. So Slim is a happily married dude. He has his, uh, his wife and his children, and he goes out. He works hard for uh, 10 months a year. He's probably putting in 80 to 100 hours a week. Uh, he's got to fix his baler, and he's got to got to make sure that his skidster is running well over the winter. So he builds uh, rebuilds transmission, and and he's got to go out and do fencing and, and calving and branding. And he, he's just got a busy life as a cowboy, and he is a hard worker and wouldn't cheat anybody. If he has a piece of equipment that he's going to sell, he, he makes sure to tell people, hey, I've used this hard, and it's... Uh, you know, I've welded it back together so many times, and, uh, you know, it ain't, it ain't brand new. Um, and he'll be completely honest about the, the state of a, something he's going to sell or anything else in life. He's honest. Now, he's not a deep thinker. And Slim thinks that he can, he can vote liberty into the world, he thinks he can, he can find the, the sludge at the bottom of the barrel, the people who wind up being politicians. He thinks he can pick the lesser of two evils and he thinks it's important that he goes down and votes, and he does so, votes in the government elections. And he, he's imperfect, but he's overall just a, a good neighbor, a good human being, making his way through life the best he can. And we're going to imagine that Slim has set a rule that everybody knows, and it is that he's a, a deeply religious, he's a theist, and he's deeply religious, and he thinks that cursing is wrong, and he thinks it's evil and horrible, and he doesn't say anything if he's just out working with the guys in the field and somebody drops a, an F-bomb. He's okay. You know, he doesn't like it, but he's not going to say anything. But when you're around his daughter, who's 14 years old, you don't use the F-word. That's just his rule. You do it, and he says, you know, he says, I hear anybody doing that, and he says, I'm clocking them. I'm going to put them on their butt. And so he's threatening violence against someone who has not initiated violence. They just made mouth sounds that are uh, he uh, is opposed to them. He finds it distasteful or evil or, or whatever his worldview perspective based on his, his state of mind. He thinks it's really awful for somebody to use the F word in front of his daughter. Should I then say this person is blatantly violating the non-aggression principle by threatening violence for nonviolent action? This is a this is a bad guy. I will no longer associate or be friends or be helpful. I'll be courteous. I'll walk by. I'm not going to go out of my way to flip him off, but I'm not going to associate any more than absolutely necessary with this person who is a uh, in, uh, intends to violate the NAP if somebody does something that isn't in line with his preferences. If they say a word that he doesn't like, he's going to initiate violence. Well, this is this is country philosophy versus strict, pure, good philosophy. And uh, so, am I saying if it's the, if it's different than good philosophy, it's bad philosophy? It may be. It's it's not as pure. It's not as good as pure philosophy. Pure philosophy would say that anybody who has an intention or a threat of violating an important principle is, you know, kind of in the bad guy column. And I'm, I'm not persuaded. I don't curse in most cases. I do occasionally, but I'm not a, I have a, a pretty decent command on the English language and I'm, I'm able to find words to, to better communicate uh, than, than the F word, but occasionally, yeah, there, there are times that it, I, I do drop it, but I can certainly control that, and it's easy enough for me not to do that uh, in front of his daughter. It's easy for me to live my life not dropping the F-bombs in front of his 14-year-old daughter, and I might have a conversation with him sometime over a beer and say, Slim, let me ask you something. You're always talking about how you clock somebody if they say a word you don't like in front of your daughter. I'd never do that. I respect her too much and I respect you. But 
I'm just wondering, you, you would you would visit violence on somebody who said a word that you don't like? Uh, would you really do that? And he might say, well, no, I'm just talking now to my, oh, I, I wouldn't really, I'd never punched anybody in my life. I, I wouldn't really do that. I just think, it, you know, she's an innocent kid. And I don't, I don't want her hearing that kind of stuff. And no, I wouldn't hit anybody, but I sure wouldn't like it. I sure wouldn't associate with it anymore. Well, okay, that kind of cleared things up with Slim. But even if he did say, no, you know, I know I'd go to jail, and I know it's it's probably morally wrong, but um, the dad's got to do what dad's got to do, and I want my daughter reared in a particular way, and, and using that kind of language around her just isn't going to cut it. I'm willing to violate, you know, what could be morally right or wrong or whatever. I'm willing to do what I got to do to make sure she doesn't hear that. Now, who knows which way Slim will go, but either of those responses, one I would like better than the other, but either response, I am not going to shun Slim from my life. When he calls and says, hey, I, I called the timber place and they got a good deal on fence posts and uh, I'm going to go down and pick up a couple pallets of them. Do you want me to grab some for you too? Well, I'm not going to say, Slim, don't ever call this number again. Uh, you know, I, I don't, don't want to deal with you anymore. And then I call the timber place and order my own pallet of uh, posts. No, I, I, I'm not going to shun him from my life. I'm still going to be a good neighbor to him. Uh, once we're finished, once I help him finish putting his fence posts in and, and we're hanging out and drinking some beers, I'm going to have a wonderful conversation with him. And we're going to have a good old time, and we might or might not get into philosophy or the non-aggression principle, but I'm still okay with having Slim as a neighbor and associating with him. Um, and I think a big part of it is, is is he has made his standards clear. He has said, this is what I believe in. This is where my line in the sand is. And I might not agree with his line in the sand. I might not agree with his standards. But he's let me know what they are. He's given fair notice. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it's fair, fair to still be his friend. Now, are there things that somebody could do that would perhaps be even less overt, uh, violating the NAP, that would make me say, yeah, I don't want to associate with this person anymore. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. If somebody said to me, um, just in passing, they didn't know my, my viewpoints in life, and they said, you know, if I ever see anybody that doesn't stand for the flag, uh, I've done it three or four times. I go out in the car, find, if I go out in the parking lot, find their car. And I pour sugar in the gas tank, slash their tires. Because if somebody's not a patriot, then they can go straight to Hades. Well, this person, no, I'm not going to associate. They are actively out uh, damaging people's property. They're initiating violence against the extension of a person, that, that which a person has created or traded for that which they've created. They're, they're, they're messing with their property, their private property. And they're they're damaging it. No, this person is not someone who I would associate with, um, especially since they're doing it over, uh, you know, over a, a philosophic difference. It's not even over like a good reason. It's just over uh, this disagreement that shouldn't even be one. Um, so yeah, that person I would readily disassociate with in a heartbeat. So I guess it kind of depends. It's a, it's a subjective thing. There are going to be things that get in my craw that don't in others. And something might bug the heck out of you and it doesn't bug me. But in the long run, I, I think it's wonderful that we have this option of association, free association. Uh, you get to be around and associate with those who you like. And if there's something that's distasteful to you about someone, whether or not I agree with it, whether or not you can explain it rationally, uh, you don't have to associate with them. That is your choice. And that is a good way to kind of, oh, I wouldn't say control society, but control our environment. Uh, because you think about Slim there, or and you think about it, if Slim and I were both pro-state people and, and we wanted to hire the government to make sure our preferences came about, Slim might go to the government and say, hey, there needs to be a law against using foul language, we'll call it breach of peace or something, there should be a law against using foul language in the presence of 
females under 15 years old. And he might try to get a law passed. And if I was a bad guy also, if I was pro-state, I might go and say, well, you know, there should be a law against people even threatening to initiate violence. Uh, if a person meets a certain threshold, uh, there should be a law against that. And if anybody hears uh, Slim or anyone else making a threat, um, that person should be put into a cage by people who are paid with stolen money. Um, that would certainly not be a good route to go. The idea that I can simply disassociate with someone, that's so much better, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree that that's a, a better way for society to organize itself, perhaps to have some, you know, I don't like the word controls, but some influence on how our neighbors act. If one of our neighbors is just really out of control, and then all of a sudden he finds that nobody will do business with him or be his friend or come to his barbecues, he's not invited to other people's neighborhood shindigs, and, and maybe he'll finally get the message that, hey, I'm a, a bloody jerk, and whatever behavior it is that I'm doing, isn't appreciated by these people. Now, this can also, I'm going to use the wrong term, harm the innocent. Um, it can also be harmful to people who are, in my opinion, on the right track. I'll even use myself as this example. If I told everybody in my county exactly what it was that I believed in, I would be shunned. People would disassociate in such a heartbeat. They would ignore the basic principles, how I choose to live, the fact that I'm, I'm honest, I'm hardworking, I'm helpful, I'm kind, I'm smart, generous, all these things that they would probably describe me as, and if they were asked to give a list of 10 or 20 descriptors of me, those are some of the ones they would use, but when they found out that I wasn't going to stand and salute uh, some government's flag, their preferred government's flag, that would be a deal breaker for them. They would not like that, and they would probably shun me and, uh, yeah, not treat me real well. So, yeah, it can have the downside, but they have that absolute right, just as I have that right. And nobody should be forced to associate with anyone they don't want to. And I'm, I'm not saying somebody's claiming that. I'm just saying this is a great way for us to kind of decide how we're going to treat our neighbors influence that that will later have.